Hello and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Leonard Pearlstein Gallery of the Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design at Drexel University. Today my guest is Dr. Sal Mangione. Dr. Mangione obtained his MD from the Catholic University of Rome, then trained in internal medicine, pulmonary and critical care medicine at the Medical College of Pennsylvania. He's currently Associate Program Director for the Internal Medicine Residency and Coordinator for the History of Medicine Lecture Series at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Dr. Mangione's innovative programs and teaching style have been recognized by multiple awards. His work has also been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the BBC, and NPR. He has a passion for art and a particular interest in the work of Leonardo da Vinci as it informs medical knowledge, the subject about which you will be talking with us today. Dr. Mangione, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Thank you for having me. You're a physician with a clinical practice and extensive teaching responsibilities, but you have a passion for Leonardo da Vinci. Right. Where did this come from? When did it originate? Uh, it came actually when I was still a medical student. There was an exhibit in Florence of uh, Leonardo's anatomical drawings. Uh, and I remember going there and just being amazed. Uh, I'm not the only one that shares this interest actually in the sense that many, many people, especially physicians, have been fascinated by how he was able to put together the artistic part and the scientific part so smoothly that there was really no difference. So I think what fascinates us is that he was the ultimate polymath, that for him there was no separation between science and art. For him, they were expression of the same thing, and he actually wrote about it. Well, you're going to take us through a kind of progression, or at least a various facets, of Leonardo's sketches of the body. As starting with perhaps the most famous of all sketches, and it's the first, in a way, of, a, of the beginning of a Leonardo's interest in anatomy. Could you explain some of that to us? Right. Leonardo, like most artists, got to anatomy because of the art. They had to know how the body was shaped, how it worked, because that was the best way for them to produce good artwork. Uh, Vitruvian Man is Leonardo at its peak. He's about to turn 40. Uh, and he's actually giving us an idea of what the human proportion should be. Uh, that's basically the pinnacle of the first part of his anatomic studies, which were artistic. Uh, it's also a beautiful artwork, so it's one of those situations where it's art and science at its best. And for us as physicians, it's very helpful because there are several conditions that actually are diagnosed because the body is disproportionate. It has parts that really don't fit. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, as I was um, commenting before, there is a particular condition called Marfan syndrome, where the lower part of the body is much, much longer than the torso. And of course, it is very clear if you know the proportions. And yet, it took 1896 years after Jesus Christ for somebody to recognize it. And interestingly enough, Dr. Marfan often went to Venice on uh, trips where he visited museums, and the Vitruvian Man is at the Academy of Venice. He might have seen it. He might have influenced. Um, a couple of things about this, which we'll see when we look at the other uh, sketches, uh, drawings, that uh, first of all, the writing around it is written in the typical mirror style that right. Leonardo used. Is there any reason why he did that kind of writing? Right, there are a couple of theories. The first one is that Leonardo might have been dyslexic, and actually dyslexics often think in pictures and see the world differently. Uh, it's uh, not uncommon for many artists to actually have had dyslexia. So dyslexic often write left to right to left. It gets very common for them. The second thing is that Leonardo was left-handed. And so if you had to write with ink and you went right to left, you were less likely to smear the page by doing that. So it could have been that. And then there is the theory that if Leonardo was indeed paranoid, and he might have been a little bit, this was a good way to keep the secrets. I'd like you to talk about this uh, very important, groundbreaking drawing of the female, female internal anatomy. What is significant about this? Okay, so Leonardo, Vitruvian Man is Leonardo at its peak as an anatomist and an artist. Here is the scientist that has taken over. 
So this is one of uh, the last works he produces. It's an interesting work because it's so anatomically accurate that if you look at what was available in the medical literature in those years, is no comparison. So this was eons ahead of his time. Problem is, stayed in a box in uh, the Windsor Castle for 300 years. That's the pity. Um, this is accurate, is detailed, and it's also amazingly beautiful. Represents many of the techniques of Leonardo, the cross sections that he pioneered, the, mo the different aspects of multiple layers that are so clear. And of interest, this, uh, if you look at it at close view, has teeny tiny little holes uh, that follow the outline. Why is that? And you can actually see them there. Because Leonardo was using this probably for uh, a book printing, and by using the technique of pouncing, which consisted of having some charcoal in a pouch and applying over the holes, he might have actually made copies. So it tells us that Leonardo wanted to produce an anatomy textbook. It's the perfection of the anatomy and also this idea that he wanted to write a book. At this point, I think it's important to talk a little bit about how he was able to get these, this sort of information, and that was because he was doing dissections. Correct. Can you explain to us how groundbreaking, excuse right. the pun, that was, that he right. was able to dissect right. human bodies at this right. period? Okay, so things were starting to change. The church were, was not too keen on dissections for the simple reason you needed your body at the time of resurrection. Um, but then during the 1400s, a couple of things happened. Artists really needed access to bodies so they, can, they could do better artwork. And physicians needed access to bodies. And the church started to give away mostly folks that got executed for capital punishment and gave them to the artist and gave them to the scientist. So it was not necessarily illegal, um, but was limited. Leonardo probably got to it because he apprenticed uh, with uh, Verrocchio in Florence, and Verrocchio took his students to the section. Uh, as Sigmund Freud said, the artist was the one who led the way, and then the scientist took over. And so what eventually happened is that Leonardo really wanted to understand how the body worked, the meravigliosa macchina umana, the wonderful human machine. And so it was this curiosity that led him to do more and more dissections. That's, got him, that's something that definitely got him into trouble with the church. And 500 years ago, more or less at this time, he was told to stop. Well, we'll talk more about that later. Let's move on to another one of his drawings. And this is one of the arteries of the arm. And right. there are some significant observations on this page that you right. have told me about. So this is the anatomy of the vessels of the arm, its veins and arteries, but what is really interesting is these two compare, this, the comparison of the two, these two vessels. Uh, you see the tortuous vessels on our left, mm -hmm. and then you see the straight vessels on the right. So Leonardo tells us that in uh, uh, a winter, uh, in early 1500, he found himself in Florence, and he had the opportunity to do an autopsy of an old man who died in front of him at the age of 100, and he wanted to understand why he died so peacefully. And then, a few days later, he autopsied a baby, a, a little boy that was two years old. And so he could compare, and if you flip it and you read the, the Italian, the straight vessels belong to a giovane, to a young person, to the boy, and the tortuous vessels belong to the vecchio, to the old man. So Leonardo here in the writings um, understands that the old man has died so peacefully because the blood supply to the heart and to the extremities was compromised by excessive nutrition that had choked the vessel. Conversely, the boy didn't have that. So this concept of atherosclerosis comes from astute observation, which brings us to another important point. Leonardo, in many ways, pioneered science, was observation and uh, was absolutely no reliance on what had been written before. And that, in many ways, was because Leonardo didn't have access to that, and he was, in many ways, an outsider. So he actually was proud of the fact that he wasn't biased by wrong information. Here are some uh, sketches of the leg bones. Correct. And what's in important about these? The multiple views. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, we know more and more than people that think in pictures, visual-spatial thinking is the undercurrent of creativity and innovation. 
And actually, many people that think in pictures tend to be dyslexic, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so thinking in words may not be as beneficial as thinking in pictures. Leonardo clearly was a brain that thought in pictures. And what you see here is thinking in pictures at its best. So he pioneers the idea of giving us multiple views. So you see the front, you see the back, you see the side, and he tells us you have to see the piece as if you were walking around it. And here, another interesting thing that he pioneers are these guide wires. See these strings that he puts on the side? is to mimic the function of muscles. So he could move from the anatomy to the function. In general, is the, most of the information is conveyed visually, and it's anatomical. And conversely, the physiological is in text. But as you can see just from the sheet, the text is minimal. It's all information that is visual. How did this compare with medical textbooks of the day? Oh, it's absolutely amazing how he was ahead of his times by easily 150 years. In fact, many of the things he discovered had to be rediscovered 150 years later and are now named after the ones who rediscovered them. <laughs> uh, so Leonardo was ahead. The only problem is that whether it, it because he was a bit secretive and paranoid or whether because he was afflicted by the worst case of ADD in history, he never published. He actually writes, it's noble to think, it's not noble to produce. Mm. So it's almost like God said, I'm going to make you a genius, but I'm going to make you irrelevant. So <laughs> most of his information stayed in a chest for hundreds of years. Amazing. This is another good example of cutaways technique, cross-section cutaways technique which are now standard, Leonardo pioneered them. What he was doing here, he was looking for the seat of the soul. There were two theories, was the soul in the brain or was the soul in the heart? For Leonardo, it was in the brain and he identifies it in the cella turcica, which is where the hypothesis is. So these guidelines tell you where to find it and was called the common sense, the sensus communis. So, and how did he d happen upon that? area as the seat of the soul. Well, that was his bias, but part of his work, which is the one that eventually got him into trouble, was the search for the soul, the seed of the soul, and the time that the soul implanted in the body, which eventually led him to study fetuses. Okay, which we will get to. These, what extraordinary detail here. Right, and this is again what is amazing about Leonardo. You can't call him an artist or a scientist. It's just a humanist who happens to be both. And this is beautiful. These are just simply beautiful and pleasing to our eyes. They are breathtakingly beautiful. And yet, at the same time, they're chock full of information that is new. For example, the number of vertebral bodies, the shape of the spine. This is all new information. See these guidelines? So. We call them exploded views. <laughs> so it gives us a sense of how these vertebral bodies are piled up on top of each other, and we can see them. So again, he thought in pictures. This idea of thinking in 3Ds. These Same idea. images of the hand muscles, yes. bones, ligaments. Absolutely. This is amazing, accurate information, and the function um, just ahead of his times. This is interesting because Leonardo, as an artist, got into facial expression. Now, this is another interesting thing. As a, as a species, we have muscles. They are devoted exclusively to convey emotions. <laughs> that makes no sense. Why, as a species, we should have muscles dedicated only to that? 90% of emotions are facially expressed. And Leonardo, of course, was interested in that. And here it gives us a sense of which muscles contract when you're angry, when you're happy, because he was an artist. And this is a good example of some artistic rendition. But uh, it's, again, blended from art to science without any solution of continuity. So these are the muscles of facial expression. So is it uh, studying his his more famous paintings, can you see how he implemented correct, this? Correct, correct. You can see that there's an evolution, that all this thing gets to influence his portrait, his, his, his portraits. Um, so um, there is the famous portrait of the Florentine woman that is actually the only one in this hemisphere is in Washington. That was from the early um, Florentine time, and it's not as fancy and sophisticated as, for example, the lady with the ermine, which is a little later in time. So he definitely used that information. So you can see how his anatomical work informed the way Correct. he would do facial expression. Um, this is interesting. This is interesting. Actually, this idea of the onion, multiple layers, is the idea that the layers that cover the brain 
can resemble indeed an onion and be peeled up one after another one. So Leonardo was now still studying the seed of the soul, got into the brain, gave us totally accurately the multiple layers, compared them to an onion, and gives us the idea that we have ventricles inside the brain. And how did he know about that? He filled them up with wax, liquid wax. And this is actually a technique that had to be rediscovered. <laughs> also, he was interested in the eye. Why? Because as an artist, he wanted to know how the eye works. And it's very difficult to cut an eye unless you keep it in some sort of substance that allows you to cut it. So Leonardo pioneered the technique of boiling it in egg white and then cutting it. What an extraordinary, I mean, he certainly got his hands dirty, so to speak. Well, that's the other thing. How did he do this thing? Yeah. Now imagine the situation. This place is, is in the basement, so torches lighting it up. It has to be winter because dissecting a cadaver in winter, you get more days before it melts. And of course, uh, there's got to be blood all over the place, which is potentially dangerous. And he's cutting and he's catching at the same time. And then he goes back home and he refines them. It's amazing. Amazing. And in the meantime, he had to make a living by doing the rest. And you feel he learned how to cut through trial and error? Yes, and he actually comments that uh, there are instructions in his notes on how to do good anatomy. So he says you always have to get multiple views, you always have to cut more than one body, because first you have to do the vessel. So he clearly knew what he was doing. Now these are beautiful. This is the end of his anatomical career, and it's the heart, and they are beautiful. And Leonardo contributed a lot of new information in the heart. There is actually a ligament that we still refer as the ligamento moderatore of Leonardo that was contributed. But more importantly, Leonardo was trying to understand how the heart works as a pump. He understands the heart is a pump. And so he creates himself a model, an aorta model, that he does in glass. And he has to use a dye, and he uses millet seeds. <laughs> and he understands that actually by doing that, vortices are created because he's also an expert of hydraulics. He creates canals. So you get the point, and Leonardo talked about it, that knowledge for Leonardo of any kind was helpful. Because in the end, he contributed to the understanding. Which we know it's very true. Many contributions, uh, many Nobel Prize contributions, came from fields, from people that were expert in other fields. Mm -hmm. But they had that inside that allowed them to create something new. Your point, earlier point, that he was an outsider Right. Uh, is fascinating and right. that you feel made it possible for him to perhaps bring knowledge from so many different places together to make Correct. his discoveries. So Leonardo is the ultimate outsider. He actually boasts about it. He says uh, most human beings are only good for filling toilets. <laughs> he says if you're alone you're all yours. If you're with someone you're only half yours. He's not antisocial. Um, he had good friends that stay with him till the end but clearly he picked his friends. Now, we know that if you are an outsider, and why was he an outsider? Well, number one, he was a gay man in a very macho culture. And he was openly gay in the sense that, um, you know, he loved to stand out. He, had, uh, he wore pink. He loved pink. In fact, uh, Plato in uh, Raphael's School of Athens is Leonardo and has a pink toga. Uh -huh. So that already was a strike. Secondly, he was a vegan in a society of gluttons. <laughs> he was a left-handed man in a society that preached that the left is the hand of the devil. Sinister. He was yeah. a bastard in a society where only legitimate sons could make it. And he was not well-educated in a society where the intelligentsia shunned the artist. Why was he not well-educated? He knew no Latin, tried to teach it to himself, and he knew no Greek. So he was self-educated because now the printing press gave books to people. He's actually, in many ways, a product of the printing press for two reasons. He read books, and he had a library, and we know what he read. And two, he had access to paper, cheap paper. Leonardo without paper would not be possible. Huh. That's a wonderful overview of his, how singular he was, how, how his outsider status worked. And again, if you're an outsider, and you get depressed because you're an outsider, it's not going to work for you. Mm -hmm. But if you think that you're an outsider and you are brighter than the others, then you have one other reason to show them. And that's what we read from his notes. The fools, they think, I don't know. I'll prove them. This is an extraordinary drawing. 
Right. And I know it's also a very pivotal one in terms of his career right. as an anatomist, as a doing dissections. Could you talk to us about Right. It? This is the ultimate example of how the boundaries between art and science here completely collapse. Martin Kemp wrote a paper in Nature call it, um, calling it a miracle of intense presentation. It's just beautiful. So what was going on here? This is towards the end of his life. He's now um, back to Florence. He's about to go to Rome. And he gets intrigued by when does the soul implant itself? So when is the fetus acquiring a soul of his own? So he starts dissecting fetuses and dead pregnant women. That definitely didn't go down too well with the church. <laughs> um, so that's why he was doing this. It's amazingly beautiful. It's one of the few where he touched the feeders with red uh, charcoal. Um, that is red chalk. That is actually not common in Leonardo. Most of these are ink and pen. But this one, he loved it so much that he touched it up. So it's just artistically beautiful. It's also very accurate in terms of the information on the circulation of the placenta. Yeah. Why is it relevant for us? Because I think that's what got him eventually into trouble. Leonardo had a German assistant that knew about lenses. There is a theory that he was trying to develop, in, to develop a telescope. And he w didn't want to give away secrets, so he, the two were not getting along. And this fellow denounced him for necromancy and um, mistreatment of cadavers. And basically the church, at that point the Pope was a Medici, told him to stop. And Leonardo understood that things were getting tough and left and went to France. And he spent the last three years there and he died. So that was, this was essentially his last dissection. He's one of the last, the last ones, last. which yeah. is interesting because it's 500 years now. And at the same time, Vesalius is born. Could so, you tell us who Vesalius is? Yeah, we are celebrating this year the 500th anniversary of Vesalius. Vesalius is another outsider. He's a Flemish anatomist who moves to Padua, the Harvard of the time and goes for the jugulars of the medical establishment. That definitely doesn't win him too many enemies and eventually he'll self-combust. But Vesalius gives us anatomy because he publishes the book. The Fabrica, which is an amazing mix of scientific information and artistic beauty. How come? Well, he gets an artist to do the drawings. <laughs> and this artist might even have been Titian or at least was an assistant of Titian. They are beautiful. Well, the question is, did Vesalius have access to this information? There are some people that think he did. Why? Where were these drawings? They were not too far from Padua in the hands of one of the assistants of Leonardo, a fellow named Francesco Melzi, who was so devoted to the memory of his master that he showed it to anybody who had an interest. So there is a theory that Vesalius actually got the idea. We're, we're close to being out of time, and I want to widen the lens a little bit and have you uh, talk to us about how some of this information has worked for you as a teacher right. of medical students and residents. Do you feel that it's, what role does it play, and what role do you feel art in general plays for medical students and doctors? Well, it's a good question, and I think the question is, what is a doctor? And I think we should start by asking that question. Now, if you look back at what physicians traditionally have been, they've been much more than technicians. If you look at what we have become now, we're technicians. Hmm. Now, physicians have been healers, they've been artists, they have been travelers, they have been legislators, they have been revolutionaries, Che Guevara. They have been so many things that what is fascinating about the medical profession is that it's like a Rorschach test. It tells us more about ourselves than about the craft. I think Leonardo is an inspiration for students to be more than a technician. Moreover, there is the clear-cut evidence that if you think in pictures, you're going to see more stuff. And that can be very helpful for a physician since astute observation is at the core of the medical profession. So there is a lot of, to learn from. In fact, actually, interesting enough, Leonardo in one of the courses writes about it. If you're interested in me, study me. <laughs> and uh, so reader, if you're interested in me, study me. And yet you said that he did not make his work available. That's a paradox. Right. Right. Well, Leonardo was probably not happy with the work until it was totally complete. And given his brain, could never happen. Because each part of the work led to another question, to another need for reading, for experimenting. So by default, he could never finish it. I think the lesson from Leonardo is 
the beauty of the human brain. There were very few people that walked the earth that can serve as an inspiration like Leonardo. And of course, the beauty of these sketches themselves, even though they were, they've been superseded right. and other scientists have come up, still, you can't find something that you can look at with such pleasure Absolutely. anywhere else. Absolutely. Even though they're very scientific and technical. Absolutely. And by the way, for uh, the viewers, if they're interested in seeing these things, the Queen of England has actually produced an app. Uh, the Queen of England has more than 200 of anatomical drawings by Leonardo. In fact, they are almost all there. And now there is a high definition app uh, for the iPad where you can see them, you can read the text, and it's wonderful. Well, I want to thank you so much, thank you. Dr. Thank you for Mancioni. This has been a really insightful interview. Thank you. Pleasure. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel interview.